Bible lies in its being the very words of God written to us. The Bible carries absolute authority as to the factionless of God's revelation. And whenever God speaks, either directly or indirectly, through one of his prophets or apostles, there is not only perfect accuracy, but absolute authority as well. The words the Lord said occur almost 800 times. And the words, thus saith the Lord, are a recurring refrain. God's revelation has come generally to us through his world. We see his glory, his power, his creation is an awesome display of what he has called into existence in the heavens and earth. God has revealed himself specifically in his written word. Psalms 19 is a wonderful description of the word of God and what it does in our lives. It is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. It restores, makes us wise, causes us to rejoice. It enlightens our eyes. It endures forever and is totally right. To experience life as God intended, we must be in God's word. Its effect on us is more beneficial than anything else that we could read or study, watch or listen to. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to worship here at Redeemer Evangelical Church. We welcome you this, this afternoon as we gather in our Lord's house today. As we do so today, we are um, going to be beginning a three-part uh, celebration of the Reformation. So the Reformation is in three weeks, um, and two weeks, I should say, but three Sundays from now. And uh, so we're going to be looking at the Reformation and some of the great principles that have come down to us as Lutheran Christians. Uh, Maybe a chance if you look at your email on Friday, I gave you a little preview of it. Um, in, the, uh, in the Reformation, we have uh, the principles of, of by grace alone, by faith alone, and by scripture alone. And today, our, our worship is going to focus on the one of those, which is sola scriptura, by scripture alone. And so let us begin our worship today with the singing of our first hymn, the first three verses of a hymn, um, a great Reformation hymn, O oh God, our Lord, your holy word. Please. 
Let us rise. Today we're going to use the three principles to, for our confession of sins and absolution. Our Reformed heritage, heritage focuses on the principles which Martin Luther rediscovered in his study of God and his word. We begin by confessing our failures to put these teachings into practice. As we again hear God's word speak to us, may we be challenged to draw power from God's grace through his word, that we may by faith believe, live, and confess the truths of the scriptures to others. Together we confess under the theme, by grace alone. How easily, O Lord, we have taken your love to us for granted. We have frequently accepted your great blessings with our word of thanks. We have received your forgiveness without telling others of the greatness of your mercy. Forgive our ungratefulness, O Lord, for Jesus' sake. What comfort and hope there is in the great assurance that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How important it is that we also tell others God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We confess our sins under the theme by scripture alone. Although you encourage us to grow in our faith through your word, we often find excuses to avoid regular Bible study. In a world where so many have little respect for your word and the teachings drawn from it, we have failed to respond to those who attack the Bible and its teachings. Forgive our failures to study a word and defend it. The Lord continues to offer to us his promises. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. In the midst of the doubts of sinful people, we are reminded that prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We confess our sins under the theme by faith alone. We know that it is only faith in Christ which saves. In spite of frequent reminders of this truth, we at times seem to base our relationship with you more on our church membership or on our good deeds. We leave unchallenged those who confess a faith based on a salvation by sincerity of belief or good works. Forgive our lack of trust in your saving plan or promises. Your word invites us to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. We are sure that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. and strength and ever-present help in trouble. We believe in God. We believe in God the Son. We believe in God the Holy Spirit. Glorify the Lord with me. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. You have delivered me from the attacks of the people. You have exalted me over my foes. Great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Your word 
is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let us pray that God would speak to us in his word as we sing the following hymn, Speak, O Lord. You may be seated. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to start today, I'd like you to look at this quote. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of life. What do you think about that? Look at it again. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Agree with that? Don't agree with that? Maybe the context will help you a little bit. The context, that is a statement from a ruling of the United States Supreme Court in 1992 in the case of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Planned Parenthood of Pennsylvania versus Casey. And the justices said, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence. There might be some here today who say, yeah, I could live with that. And there might be some, I'm hoping, who will say, no, I can't live with that. Because these words are very anti-scriptural and they're very anti-Christian. We do not have the right to define 
uh, the concept of our own existence and the meaning of life and the mystery of human life because we haven't made it. But yet we live in a world today and our children are growing up in a world today in which this is one of the major philosophies of the secular world. That we have a right to define ourselves. Today, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be starting this uh, a three-week look at the Reformation and these three um, great principles um, of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura by Scripture alone, Sola Gracia by grace alone, and Sola Fide by faith alone. And, and today, uh, the Reformation, I should say, is one of my favorite minor church festivals. I love the Reformation. I love digging into um, our Lutheran heritage and what God um, has given to us, and particular uh, this first one that we're going to be looking at, by Scripture alone. The Bible. This is what God has given to us. And it's under attack today, and we need to always go back and remind ourselves, what does this book, this Bible, this Word of God mean for us as Christians? And we can do nothing better but to go back into the, God, into the Bible and particularly look at Psalm 119, verses 105, which says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Uh, some of you might remember this. This was my confirmation verse. I love this verse. Now, this verse is going to tell us a couple of things, isn't it? First of all, if it's a light, why do we need light? Because there's darkness. There's darkness in the world. The world is dark. I've shared this with you before, but just to remind you that the average American is lied to every day over 200 times. Unless you don't watch TV or read the newspaper. If you're reading the Bible, you're not being lied to. But... The world around us lies to us all the time. That quote that I had before from the Supreme Court is a lie. And we should be surprised by that because Satan, as the Bible calls him, is a father of lies. And he's always trying to lie to us. But you know what? We don't even need Satan to lie to us because it's already inside of us. Remember King David uh, talked about how he, he was, even as he was conceived, he was conceived in sin. That our hearts itself are dark because of our own particular sin. But God's word shines through all of that. It breaks into our hearts. And it shines on us. The marvelous gift that God has given to us. And sometimes when we, when we wake up in the morning and we have this day ahead of us. And we walk out those doors and we walk into spiritual darkness. But having God's word, it lights our way. Your first redeemer truth is God's word lights our way. That's what Martin Luther brought back to the church as he studied scripture and as he op and God opened his heart and he, God, as God opens our house, that we live by sola scriptura, we live by scripture alone. But why? Why is this principle so important? Well, it's because of this. You know what that, that's of course, is our human brain. And the, the, the brain is a magnificent thing, isn't it, that God has given to us. Someone once described the brain this way. I thought this was just really cool. It's a fabulous living supercomputer with unfathomable circuitry and unimaginable complexity, a collection of billions of neurons each as complex as a small computer, like having 100 billion computers inside your cranium. And they're all interconnected. One scientist said that the number of connections with one human brain rivals the number of stars and galaxies in the entire universe. That's just a mind boggling, isn't it? When you think that inside here is a supercomputer and it's filled with information but you know what happens. This, any computer can have bad information and it can have good information. What are we gonna fill our minds with and our brains with and our thoughts with? 
It is true that what we eat does feed our brains, gives it brain power, right? But what we take through our eyes and what we take through our ears fills our brain, that little, this, this magnificent super, supercomputer, with all kinds of facts. Now, remember what I said before? The average American has lied to 200 times. That is, if you're watching the normal things on TV and, and, and reading the newspaper and all the other social media stuff. That's filling our brains. Parents, do you understand when your children are watching videos or whatever movies, do you understand what information is being stored in their brains? So what do we need? We need the Bible. We need God's word more and more in our lives. The apostle, uh, the writer of Hebrews writer says this, Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, focus your attention on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. Notice it says, focus your attention. And what does that mean? That means, think about it. Think about Jesus. Focus our attention on him. We all realize that we can have negative thoughts, right? And negative thoughts are already inside of us, but then Satan tries to strengthen those negative thoughts inside of us. It's the Bible. It's God's word. It's only God's word that points us to Jesus, our Savior, and gives us the beautiful thoughts, lights up our thoughts. The thoughts of Jesus and his magnificent love for us and what he has done for us. And how is this accomplished? Notice what the writer says in Psalm 119. I have hidden your sayings in my heart that I may not sin against you. We need to hide God's word in our brains and our hearts. To put it inside of us. Now I'd like you to think, again, I'd like you to think about this. Why is a commercial on TV run over and over and over and over again? In the morning, when I'm listening to WJJQ, some of those commercials, I, I, I just want to tune them out. But that's the point. They want to drill that information into your brain so much that the moment you hear the beginning of that commercial, oh, it's about Tomahawk Community Bank. Oh, it's about People's Bank. Or, oh, it's about uh, this store in town or that store in town. If that's true for the, the things of this world, is it even more true for God's word? And here I'm going to be a little harsh a little bit. But brothers and sisters, if this is the only time you read God's word when you're in church, is that enough to fill your brain? No. We want to hide that. And we hide it by repeating it over and over and over again. And that's why your second truth is God's word lights our thoughts in lights up our thoughts, the thoughts that God wants us to have. And that's why solo scripture is so important. It's important because this needs it. But it's, it's also important we have it because of this. Now you're looking at that, if you're looking at that picture, a drainage tube. Those are the drainage tubes that we put into the parking lot. Put it, put it, re, reform, repositioned rather, um, where we're building. Now, since 2005, underneath our parking lot, unseen and quietly, these drainage tubes have been working, taking the water away from the building. Because you know that water can be very damaging, can it? In fact, if you look a little closer, if you look above the tube there, you can see how the, the water has already eroded some things. The Bible is like those big tubes in the heart. It's meant to protect us. It's meant to protect us at our brains and our hearts and our souls 
as Psalm 119 says, I have hidden your sayings in my heart that I may not sin against it. One of the most productive things that we can always do is to hide God's word. Now, it's not easy. It's not easy to keep, to, to continue, to, because it comes down to repetitive use of God's word. Now, I'm telling you, last week, this last week, when we were, we're putting those drainage tubes in, and we're doing a lot of shoveling, and, and Dave will testify, the ground wasn't this beautiful sand. It was rocky. And you put your shovel in there, ooh, just because you'd hit a rock. And by the end of the day, your body felt jarred. It wasn't easy work. I'm telling you, it's not easy to put the God's word in our brains. And you know why? Because we always bump into the stones of our sins, into the rocks of our own pride and disobedience. There's always something else that tries to get our attention. But there's no better thing you can do for your life than to put God's word in your brains and in your hearts. Because it lights the way, it lights your thoughts, and it lights all of our decisions that we need to make in life. When we look at what God's word says. But there's one more thing. But before we get to that, I want to take a, just a, a break. As the people of the Old Testament would often do, they would stop and they would use the Psalms to think about what it is that they've just studied. Psalm 119 is a, I'm sorry, Psalm 19 is another beautiful Psalm. And let's spend a moment just thinking about how beautiful that word of God is as we speak Psalm 119, I'll speak the first line, you'll speak the indented line. The law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is bright. The fear of the Lord is pure. It stands forever. The just decrees of the Lord are truth. They are righteous. They are more desirable than gold. Even better than much clear gold. They are sweeter than honey. Even honey dripping from the honeycomb. Now, you just confessed that the word of God is so very important to you that the scriptures the sola scriptura, by scripture alone. Right? But there's something else about the Bible. There's something that it shows you that is the most important of all. Yes, it lights your way. Yes, it lights your decisions and your thoughts. But there's something even more. What does the Bible show you? It shows you this. The pictures that we have of Jesus that rotate in our altar, that, that, fo that focus our thoughts on his life, his birth, his life, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. You and I would not know about Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, if it were not for, for God, for the Bible. Now, I'm just telling you that it's possible to read the Bible and not see Jesus. A lot of people have done that. When Jesus came, the people, the religious leaders of the day, they, they knew the Bible backwards and forwards, but they didn't see Jesus. Because they turned the Bible, they corrupted the Bible into a how-to manual of how, how they could get to heaven by their own works. But Jesus said to them in John 5, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He says, he said to them, you study the scriptures, but understand everything in the Bible is about Jesus. Everything points us to Jesus. Do you remember what happened the night before, the, uh, the night Jesus was born? What did, the, what did the, uh, the angel say to the shepherds? Wander around for a while and see if you find some baby. 
No. Go to Bethlehem and you'll find the Lord, the Savior, lying in a manger. That was pretty specific. This is where you're going to find Jesus. You're going to find him in the manger. Martin Luther once made this statement. Scripture is the manger in which we find the Christ Jesus. You will not find Jesus anywhere else except in Holy Scripture. You won't find him traveling around the world on a boat looking up at the stars at the seashore. You're not going to find him there. You find him in the word. Remember what the apostle Paul said? I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Paul was telling us that everything in the Bible points us to the fact that Jesus is our Savior. You see Jesus right away at the beginning of the Bible. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did God do? I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, Satan. He promised a savior. When God came to Abraham and he said to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to leave your homeland. I want you to go to a place I'm going to tell you. And then he said, all nations on earth will be blessed through you. We see Jesus there. Because is Jesus was a descendant of Abraham and all people are blessed through him. When God said to Abraham, hey, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your own son. We see Jesus because Abraham didn't sacrifice his son. God stopped him from doing that. But God the Father sacrificed his son for us. When God's people were brought up out of Egypt, and remember the Passover that came out of that deliverance from Egypt, and the, and the angel of the Lord passed over the houses that had the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. We see Jesus because now, because of Jesus, death has passed over us because we are covered with the blood of Christ. And of course, when we look at Christmas and Bethlehem, we see Jesus. When we look at the cross, we see Jesus. And when we look at the empty tomb, uh, we see Jesus. There were some people one time who came, um, and, and they didn't come to Jesus directly. They, they came to the disciples. They figured they had to go to the disciples first, but their request was, we would like to see Jesus. Brothers and sisters, you probably have been asked the question, or maybe played the game, if there's one person in history that you would love to meet, who would it be? You get to meet Jesus every day as you open up the Bible and it reveals Jesus to you. And that is why this, above all everything else, the Word, God's Word, lights up Jesus as our Savior. And this week in your devotions, you're, I'm going to give you passages that you're going to look at that are going to remind you that no matter what situation you go through in life, God's word points out Jesus to you. So now what do you think of this quote? At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of life. I hope that by now, you go back and you're thinking, yeah, no, that's not a good thing. And I'm hoping... And I'm praying that by now, you're realizing that there are so many anti-Christian and anti-scriptural lies that are being projected upon us every day and on our children. But listen to what Martin Luther said. From the beginning of my Reformation, I've asked God to send me neither dreams nor visions, nor angels, but to give me the right understanding of his word, the Holy Scriptures, for as long as I have God's word, 
I know that I'm walking in this way and that I shall not fall into any error or delusion. Brothers and sisters, let's pray what Martin Luther did. Not for dreams, not for visions, not for angels to come to us, but that we understand God's word. And this is so important, especially in the time that we live, that in, in, in this time that is so divisive. And people have all kinds of opinions about this, that, politics, it's all, it's tearing people apart. And you know why it tears apart? When people start with their sense, with the words, I think. I think is an opinion. It's not the truth. Maybe it might be the truth, but not always. It's an opinion. That's why I've tried to make it a point. I try very hard not to share my opinions with you. Because I'm just a man. And my opinions aren't any better than your opinions. But we all can say, this I know to be true. God's word is truth. And God's word guides my way in life. That is the light that God has given to us, brothers and sisters. Let's cherish that. Let's use that. And let every day of our lives, when we wake up in the morning, what's one of the first things we do, especially in these dark mornings? We turn on the light, right? We don't want to be stumbling around in the dark. We go outside. We turn our headlights on. Why? Because we can't be driving the car down the dark road. Let's not step out of our houses out of our homes into the spiritual darkness of this world without, first of all, taking the word of God and hiding it in our hearts so that it shines our way, the way of God's love throughout each and every day. Let's ask God to do that as we rise to sing. God and Father, we give you thanks for blessings, for the blessings we share as members of your holy church, for your gracious word and sacraments, for opportunities to worship and to grow in faith and knowledge, for occasions to serve and be served, for fellowship with believers in our congregation and in our synod. Jesus Christ, Lord of the church, you give grace to your people by calling us to be your witnesses in the world. 
Open our eyes to see the great and noble mission that lies before us in the hurting eyes of the lonely, in the pained eyes of the sick, in the searching eyes of the lost. Help us to see your face, O oh Jesus, and to serve others as we would serve you. Spirit, giver of life through word and sacrament, give us the wisdom and power we need to witness clearly and to act boldly. Help us to speak the truth in love, to give the reason for the hope we have, and to conduct ourselves with gentleness and respect. God, in your love, you have stepped towards us. With each step, our Savior approached the cross and the tomb for us. Your loving steps to the cross have saved us. Bless your church with our service. Inspire us to be willing to proclaim your word throughout our lives. Let our first steps ministry be not about buildings or institutions, but about leading people to Jesus. Gracious Lord, give wisdom to all the people who are working so diligently on our first steps ministry. Bless their work. Keep all of our volunteers safe and help each of us contribute in whatever way we can. Help us to work with all urgency that many more may be led to take steps to you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times. And in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave him thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take away the sin. 
during the time of distribution, we're going to be listening to some songs that uh, were sung last week during our outdoor worship service. Thank you. 
party. Let's rise for prayer. Father in heaven, once again you blessed us with your love, your mercy. In word and sacrament, you have come to us and we see Jesus. That's all we need to see, Father, is to see Jesus and his amazing love. As we walk into this week, dispel the darkness of this world around us with the light of Jesus through the wonderful gift of your word. We pray, Lord, that the light of Jesus would be in the hearts of Dean Tesh, Joe Carl, Bob Westcott, and Bev Shepke as they battle against cancer in their lives. Let the light of Jesus be with Chris Callahan, Bob Firehammer, Tuli Goldbeck, Dick Leibsky, Carl Bartz, and Ed and Sally Nyberg. Gracious Father in heaven, we want, ask for your blessing upon Connor Johnson this coming Tuesday during his surgery. We pray that that surgery is successful and that his recovery is quick. Father in heaven, in a world in which we live, not just normal times, but every time, there are those who are silently suffering. For those that we may be aware of that are suffering and those that are, we are unaware of, be their hope, their guide, their stay, their strength in life. In the midst of their silent suffering and the darkness that might be around them, let the light of your word 
shine upon them so that they see Jesus and see his care, his forgiveness, his grace for them. We commend all of us into your care. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. And we close our worship with that great hymn, which has often been called the theme hymn of the Reformation. God's word is our great heritage. I just, I always love this time of year. I love being able to talk about the Reformation and what that all means to us. Um, and I pray that once again, you've been encouraged today and, and revitalized today in your, in your principle that is by scripture alone. Um, and we're going to continue the thought next week. We'll be looking at by faith alone. And then the following week we'll be looking at by grace alone. You're reminded that um, uh, the devotions uh, are in your bulletin so you can take them home with you. Uh, we can't reuse the bulletin, so just take them with you. The offering plates are back by the door. We are uh, resuming our Sunday morning Bible study. We're doing a, a study on the apostles, the, the message and the life of the apostles. In your bulletin, you saw an employment opportunity for the Learning Center. So uh, if you're looking for a little, little extra gig, um, uh, take a look at that. And also there was the update for that. So um, this week, um, God willing, uh, well, last week we talked about patience. Remember, we talked about patience. I'm trying to be very patient. Um, but uh, it sounds like Monday the Mason will be here, and, and then all that work will be starting. And that's, of course, a big process of, of getting all of that down, the, the footings and, and all that. So it's a pretty major thing. So um, keep praying for it as we continue to move forward. With that, we wish you Lord's blessings. Have a great night, and take time to say hi to each other around you.
got it. Thanks, Ivan. Thank you. Whenever you get cancer, correct me. No, we're 